All right, let's do, there it is, Colossians. <clears throat> and actually, I'm going to read a little bit more than that. I have a little bit more time than I did on Thursday, so we'll do a little bit more. And Matt, our sound guy, skipped Thursday night, so now you get to hear the study, buddy. I'm doing it for you. <laughs> now let's read a little bit, uh, Colossians 2. We're going to start in verse 4, and we're going to go through 8. So ignore that slide. It says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, for though I am absent in flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through empty philosophy or through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And let's pause there and just pray for the study. Lord, we just uh, come before you right now, Lord, and lift this time up to you, God. We want it to be focused and centered on you and who you are. And God, that you would uh, be speaking the truth tonight, Lord. It would be your word that is magnified and not my thoughts or ideas or my, I don't know, just agenda, Lord, but it would be yours. And so we give the time to you, pray you'd be honored, and, and we ask this in your name. Amen. And uh, if you guys don't know me, I'm, uh, my name is Zach Lamberson, and I'm the college pastor at, at Calvary here. And actually, I've been here for a long time. Uh, I started coming when I was in seventh grade, and so I've been here for a, a while. And actually kind of grew up in the church and, you know, started helping out in high school ministry uh, and did worship for a long time and then eventually became the junior high pastor, which I did for eight glorious years, and I loved every second of it. And uh, God moved me on from that. I think eventually everyone has to move on from junior high, unfortunately. But it took me eight years to graduate, but I finally did it. <laughs> and uh, my wife and I now do our favorite ministry, which is college ministry. And we love it. I mean, it's so much fun for us to do, you know, to hang out with young adults. And I'm only 33, but I still feel like I need to be around younger people to make me feel not so old. So... Actually, I just got hope today. I don't know. I was, I was watching yesterday's Mariners game, and there is a 33-year-old a pitcher who pitched for this very first time in the big leagues. And I took, I told my wife today, "There's still hope for me." You know, it's like I haven't pitched. I haven't actually pitched ever really since probably third, fourth grade. But I feel like I could still do it. I still have something in the tank. But uh, we love doing things with young adults, and, you know, one of the things that's been real fun is our group's not really like a, a singles group, which a lot of young adults groups are. They're, you know, just to hook up, but we have had a lot of marriage come from it, and I've done a lot of marriage ceremonies over the last few years, and I, I've got a couple, uh, at least one more this summer, so, as, as I know of so far, and I love it. We have such an a awesome group, and actually saw a lot of them exit out these doors, and the reason is because we met on Thursday night, and they've heard this study. And we do discipleship Sunday night. So half of the, the ladies who weren't even here to represent are at my wife's house, or at my house, with my wife. And uh, we, we have the same house. We live together. Just so you guys are wondering. And then uh, the guys go down to the cafe Sunday nights, and that's where you'll see this mass exodus on Sunday nights. But it's, it's actually been really neat just to get together with these people. And uh, my favorite part is these, you know, these relationships that you build and these people you get to know and these friendships that you have that last so long. And, you know, what inspired me to do this series, which our group is called Rooted, and that was kind of the, you know, I actually took it from this passage in Colossians when we started five years ago, and the group started in my wife and I's living room, and it's kind of grown from there, and, we, you know, we depends on the week, <laughs> which is, you know, like most services, but we can have between 40 and 60 people, you know, kids, which is really neat, I and mean, we have a good, solid group. I know there are churches in town that big, and so I feel like that's pretty special, and actually, I was chatting with uh, one of the young adults uh, just last week about that. He's like, you know, this is so cool. This is what you guys get to do. You guys worship together. You have Bible teaching. It's really awesome. And, you know, it's not unique to, you know, just our church that we get together and we worship and go through the Bible. I know there are other places that do it. And God is, you know, working in people all around the world. But 
one of the things my wife and I realized when we started doing college ministry is there's not that many people that actually do it, even in our town. You know, we call Calvary's, uh, you know, and other cities, even cities with like major universities. And we're like, so do you guys have a college group? And sometimes the answer is no, we don't have one at all. Or a lot of times the answer is we have a very small one. And it's pretty sad to me because, you know, I think I was sharing this last week with you guys. I feel like the young adults are like the backbone of the church in a lot of ways. They're not the most talented for sure. And they're not the most gifted and the wisest, but they are the most available. And uh, they have like just a lot of, you know, excitement about them. And, you know, I really feel like that's a, such a ripe age group to activate into the ministry to catch fire for Jesus. And sadly, in our culture, it's more of a time to explore worldly passions and pleasures. And young adults leave college more to escape like what they would consider the moral confines of the home. And, you know, a lot of kids who grow up in Christian homes feel like they have to go out and explore the world and see what the world has to offer them. And they dig into philosophies that corrupt both the mind and the soul and leave them emptier than they, at least emptier than they thought they were before. And you guys see it, you know, it's on the news constantly. You see these, you know, uh, campuses where students are protesting and then the reporters will come up to them and say what are you protesting and they don't even know they just want to be a part of something they want to ha they have passions about things but really they don't know what they want to be a part of they don't know what the, what it is that their life is for and they fight for social justice but they really don't know what either of those words mean and they want to make the world a better again a better place by pouring their passions into a movement but it ends up becoming chaos rather than creating peace and destruction, rather than unification. And the void that they've been trying to fill or to make themselves feel like they're part of something actually just becomes even greater. And the stats that, uh, you know, that concern me the most are the number of Christians who grow up and leave the church in college years. It's staggering, you guys. And it's, it's very sad, and it's such a, a con commonality in our culture and a prevailing issue and I feel like the, the major cause, the number one cause for this is the fact that these kids were never rooted in the first place. I mean, they might have gone to church. They might have, you know, served in Sunday school. They might have sang in choir. They might have read their Bibles and prayed, but they, they never had roots sinking deep. Their faith was weak. They had no depth. And they had no, I would call them eagle powers, as, as Nacho Libre would say. And uh, actually in Matthew 13, uh, Jesus said this. He says, he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediate, immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but only endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And because of the lack of depth in their faith, to which many will never return to the church because they never had those roots. And again, it's a very sad thing. And so I titled the study for tonight, How We Root. How we root, how we sink in our roots, how to access your eagle powers. Uh, and again, that's an inside joke. If you've never seen Nacho Libre, you are not my friend. But we can hang out and we go watch it together. Actually, I remember the very first time I showed Pastor Steve Nacho Libre. We were at the college beach retreat like three or four years ago. And he just laughed and laughed and laughed the whole time. It's so dumb. It really is. But that's my personality. So there you go. You know, my wife and I, uh, over the years, have kicked around the idea of changing the college group name because she actually, she would tell you that she doesn't like it and she thinks it's kind of played. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know, a lot of groups use it or whatever. But I, I just always go back to the burden that God places on my heart to not just do it for college ministry, but to see people discipled. I want to see people who have faith that stands the weathers of the storms of this life. And, you know, if you're talking to, from the worldly perspective, any business or, or corporation will tell you that it needs a mission statement to be successful. And the mission statement is going to encapsulate the purpose of this company. And if a company does not know why it exists, how are they going to measure their success or their failure? Well, I would say the same applies to the church. If you don't know what the church or the purpose of the church is, why we do what we do, then how do we measure success or failure? And it applies to individuals as well. How do we know, you know whether or not we're being successful the way that God would have us if we don't know what we're here for in the first place, if we don't know why we exist? And these are, again, very big 
uh, large monumental type questions, and I'm not going to answer them all fully tonight, but that's kind of where I want to go with this tonight is just talk about, you know, who the, the grand scheme of things, like you know, just generalities, because, you know, we're not going to be able to get into specifics. That's kind of the, the point of the series I'm doing with our college group is to get more specific as we go, but to kind of get a baseline, a foundation for, you know, what we do as believers and how we get plugged in and how we take the kingdom principles that Jesus taught us and go and make disciples, right? Jesus said that was actually his greatest commission. That's called the Great Commission. The very last thing that Jesus says to his disciples was go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And use the word creature on purpose because some people are creatures. And they, you know, it's like they need the gospel preached to them anyways. And he says you need to make disciples. Go and make disciples. That's the other aspect. And I think those two things go hand in hand. We need the gospel preached, people to hear about the salvation. And then also we need people to be rooted. We need people to be raised up and discipled. And those two things are so important. You know, a lot of times, you know, my, uh, you guys, Billy was here this morning sharing, and he's, he's got the gift of evangelism, you guys. He's just got that heart. And, you know, I've done, I've done ministry with him where, you know, we do stuff in India, and, like, you know, hundreds of people are getting saved, and he's just got a really gift to, to witness to people. And then he does it one-on-one with people on the street, and the same kind of thing. It's very fun to watch. And he kind of, you know, a long time ago, he kind of poked fun at what I do because, you know, he says that he's, he, he, this is the analogy he gave me, is he's pulling people out of the water as they're drowning, and I'm in the boat wiping their noses, is what he told me. And uh, I thought it was funny, and he's my friend, so I, t- I didn't take it to heart. But, you know, the, the, this was like probably two or three years ago he said that, and you know, at the time, I was like, I want to be more evangelistic. I need to have his gift as well. And then what God has shown me over the last few years is the, the reality of the fact that we need discipleship. As, as, as important as to preach the gospel again, we have to do that. We have to get the word out. We need people to get rooted in Christ as well. We need people that, again, just as Jesus was talking here in Matthew thir- uh, 13, who when they receive the seed, they receive it in a way that they're going to flourish. And it's not going to be stony ground or, or thorny ground or whatever. And actually, Steve is going to be chatting with, uh, talking about this on Sunday mornings real quick because he's in this passage, which is really neat. But that, again, is so important for us to, to recognize is how we grow and how we establish a faith that is worth uh, something, how we root. And I want to sp- first speak to the culture and place and time in which we live. And uh, the question I want to ask is, what is truth? Because I think as Christians, that's the first thing we have to look towards in our culture specifically, is the question of, tr- of truth. Actually, not just our culture, Pilate once asked the same question to Jesus. And it was the, you know, the moment before he was going to be crucified, Jesus was brought before Pilate, and Pilate had in his hands the life or death of Christ. And Pilate was having a conversation with Jesus in you know, Jesus is talking to him about truth, and Pilate is like, what is truth? And unfortunately, our culture has dismantled the meaning of truth. And I think the most dest- destructive doctrine we have in this postmodern generation is the attack upon truth itself. And the idea that truth is relative to time, to place, to position, or most often in our culture, it's relative to the person's emotions and that individual rather than universal truth. And by doing that, and whether we recognize it or not, it's something that's been taught for almost 100 years, that truth really isn't truth. We can't really know what is true. And by doing that, they make the absolute claims of Christ of no effect. They, they take away the power of the things that Jesus declared as truthful. And, you know, the idea that truth is relative, can something absolutely be truthful? And people will pose questions like this, and again, it's an attack, I believe, from kind of an, a bizarre way, but an attack instead of just directly at, the, at Christianity and its, at, at its claims, but on the foundations of what we believe as Christians. You guys, Jesus said in John eight thirty one through 32, he said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus preach the truth. He taught us about truth. It's the foundation, again, of what we believe. And as Christians, we are in search of what is true. Everything that God speaks is truth. And if they, you know, again, take away the foundations of truth, then the things that God speaks are of no effect. And even that statement, the truth shall make you free, 
If there is no truth, then the freedom we have in Christ has even been dismantled. Now, the problem with this stream of thought is it's contradictory to itself, and it can be easily combated if you have any you know, sense and any logic. You know, someone will say again that we really can't know things that are true. We really can't know the truth. Think about that statement. You cannot know the truth. That statement is either true or it is false. You follow me here? If that statement is false, then you can know the truth. Therefore, there are solid foundational truths that everyone can know. If that statement is true, that statement is true. Therefore, it is contradictory to itself. And again, you can know things that absolutely. There are universal truths that are not relative in this regard. And it's a very simple argument. I actually stole it from Ravi Zacharias. It's so simple, but it makes so much sense when you actually think about what relativism is. It doesn't work. Actually, it was uh, hearing a story from Ravi Zacharias. I listened to him on KBLD 91.7, as you guys should every morning. And uh, he told this story. And in, uh, in the story, he's talking about how a friend of his was giving him a tour of Chicago. And they have in Chicago, and I've, I'm not actually looked this story up and, and checked it out, but I'm sure it's good. Uh, they have the first postmodern architecture, the first postmodern building. And Ravi was like, what does that mean? And the guy was explaining to him that basically it's a building that is built on the premise that, the, you know, there really is no purpose. There's no uh, reason or meaning to things. And so there'll be rooms that have no purpose in them at all. There'll be hallways that get smaller and smaller and lead to nowhere. I mean, just random architecture that goes to nothing. Pointlessness is the idea. Absolutely nonsense. And, and then Ravi asked him the question. He says, did they do the same thing with the foundation? No, obviously not, because there's only one way to build a foundation. If they didn't have a foundation, the building would collapse. And that's what we recognize is as much as people like to make truth relative in this regard, there are some things we can know for sure, and it's why truth as believers is so important. That the, Again, the, the claims of Christ are so important. Jesus, in John 14, 6, you guys know the verse. He said to, to Thomas, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, such a bold proclamation of truth is either true or it's false. Now, Jesus again spoke these words to, to his disciple Thomas, which we know him as you know, the doubting Thomas because he was the guy after the resurrection that didn't believe that Jesus really rose from the dead and wanted to see the holes in his hands and in his feet and in his side. I actually have some respect for Thomas. Most people like, you know, knock Thomas down in a few pegs saying this guy lacked faith or whatever. And I'm like, you know what? Thomas was a guy who wanted things to be based upon truth. If he was going to live his life in such a way, he wanted the, the, a reality to be there. And you know what? Just the, the word of others wasn't necessarily good enough for him. And so Jesus reveals himself to him in this really cool scene. And you, he says, he drops down and doesn't even need to touch the holes in his hands and his feet inside. But he says, my Lord, my God. He calls Jesus his Lord. He calls Jesus God. And at that point, we recognize who Jesus is and the, the testimony of Thomas is a unique one because of the fact that he doubted even the words of the disciples. And when he saw Jesus face to face, it changed who completely who he was. By the way, Thomas, as much as more, most of the other disciples would go to their death proclaiming that truth. People don't die for a lie, you guys, especially a lie they know to be true, the false. And so these guys believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed him to be the Son of God. They believed him to be risen from the dead. And they, stuck, they staked their lives on that truth. And Thomas was one of those that died believing that truthfulness, that Jesus was who he said he was. And, you know, again, there are people who still ask the same question that Thomas asked to Jesus. How can we know the way? That was Jesus' response in four, John 14, 6. But the question was, how can we know the way? How can we know where we're going? And for millions of Christians around the world, we stake our eternity on the claim that Jesus makes in John 14, 6. That he's the way. That he's the truth. That he is the life. And everything that happens to us in this life and in the next life are based upon the reality of that truth. In fact, uh, Paul makes a really good argument in 1 Corinthians 15. It's pretty genius. And he, what he essentially does is he, he goes from the claim that if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, then we don't have a faith at all. And the reason being is because everything Jesus did in his life was leading up to the cross. And the 
the authority of the claims that he'd made as the son of God was proven by the resurrection. It was is justified or solidified by the resurrection. And what, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, and this is out of the New Living Translation, it says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. He makes a really good claim. He's like, if Christ didn't really rise from the dead, if he's not really who he said he was, then everyone who thinks their sins are forgiven, they're not forgiven. In fact, you're to be more pitied than anyone else in the world because you believe something that is supposed to be liberating. Instead, it's absolutely a cloak, a a bondage to you. It's an absolute lie. And again, it's a really good argument, understanding that the foundation, the cornerstone of Christianity is the truth, the resurrection of Christ. Uh, the second thing I want to talk to you guys about is the exclusivity of Jesus. Now, you may not like that Jesus made absolute truth claims and these claims about whether, you know, his deity and afterlife and judgment and those things, but just the fact that you don't like those things doesn't make them false. You know, there's a prevailing tone in our culture that exclusivity is wrong and we would like to be inclusive in all that we do we want to make sure everyone feels good about what they believe and you know what there are some things you know I agree with we should we shouldn't just you know be all just exclusive just for the sake of making people feel outcast that's never the gospel we're not we're not just doing things to make people feel ashamed or make people feel whatever, you know, just outside of what we're doing because we have some superior intellect or something. But there are some things that need to be exclusive. Truth is one of those things. Understanding about life and death, those are things that are exclusive. I don't know. There are some things, just think about like the way that our world functions. I think most people would agree, like I want the, you know, the designer of my parachute to be, have an exclusive understanding of how the parts work. And, you know, that these things are absolute truths and that, you know, you can't include everyone's ideas into a parachute so Parachute, because some people are going to say that that's not a good idea and it's going to destroy things, you know, whatever. And again, you get the idea here. And there's a myth that other religions aren't as exclusive as Christianity even. And uh, I'll just read you a quote from Ravi Zacharias in his book, Jesus Among Other Gods. He says, all religions are not the same. All religions do not point to God. All religions do not say that all religions are the same. At the heart of every religion is an uncompromising commitment to a particular way of defining who God is or is not and accordingly of defining life's purpose. Every religion at its core is exclusive. And this is taken from a guy who's gone around the whole world studying religions and grew up in a Hindu culture, which is the most pluralistic, you know, deities of any religion I know of, 300 million plus gods or something like that. And they have the mentality that all, you know, all roads lead to God, but they don't really. And they'll tell you that you can do whatever you want, but in every religion, there's an, an absolute stake that they, they, they recognize that if it, you don't do it their way, then you're not doing it the right way. And you can get that from talking to, again, a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Muslim or even to like a Mormon. They'll, you know, they'll want to make you feel like you're included, but ultimately it's their way or the highway. And the criterion for a faith that is worth believing in, to me, is the evidence, the proof of that faith. It cannot be based upon just feeling. It cannot be based upon your emotion. And if you judge Christianity, which a lot of people do unfairly, and they like to judge Christianity by its abuse. And you'll see this you know, on college campuses. You'll see this in arguments with atheists. They'll look at Christianity and they'll despise it because of the abuse of Christianity, meaning things like the Crusades or people went out and killed others in the name of Jesus. Well, that is not biblical Christianity. That is people who, again, have a misinformation about what the Bible says about how we treat people. When someone doesn't, uh, for example, be converted, you know, if we have an enemy of ours, for example, Jesus says to bless those people, to pray for them. Even those who hurt us, we pray for those people. We don't kill them with the sword. There are other religions that will preach that. That is not Christianity. You know, they, they judge it by the pogroms or the indulgences of the Catholic Church or all these things, so on and so on. They have all these abuses to Christianity or in the name of Christianity have been done in this world. And, you know, the reality is you cannot judge any religion based upon its abuse. Because if you 
judged every other religion upon its abuse, you could come up with the same exact arguments against everything, including atheism, by the way, which is a religion. It's caused more, I believe, more death than any other religion combined. In the name of atheism, people who think that, you know, the, the superiority of a species is the most important thing. It was the motivation behind Hitler and Stalin and killing millions of their own and the Jews and all those things. But you get the idea, and you cannot judge, or the, judge those things by its abuse. And I believe the measure to which you should test a faith is the person behind the faith, the one making these truth claims. And in the case of Christianity, it's Jesus Christ. And you judge him, and I know you will not be found wanting. That's the beauty of being a Christian, you guys, is we have someone that has stood the test of history. Like, people try to come up against Jesus, and they failed over and over. People try to say bad things about him, but they really can't. Even his enemies couldn't find things against him. You know, they're trying to look for reasons to crucify him. They're trying to find reasons to, to you know, put him to death, and they could not find any. They eventually had to make some up just so they can get him crucified. And you look at the lives, again, of the people that Jesus impacted, and the way that, you, again, they got flipped and turned around because they realized and when they looked at the life of Jesus, even his own brother, for example, James is a great example of a guy who before the life of Jesus didn't believe he was the son of God or before the resurrection didn't believe he was the son of God. And then post-resurrection would go on to be the pastor of the Jerusalem church, would write the book of James, and instead of calling himself the brother of Jesus, calls himself the bond servant of Christ because he recognizes his place. That even though I was his physical brother or half-brother, he is something special. He's something different. And my mind was convinced, even though it says in the Gospels that Jesus' brothers did not believe him at one point, after the resurrection, James and Jude clearly did. And you again have the evidence there of a changed mind. You have the evidence of the fact that these guys would wrestle with the question of who was Jesus, and they came to the conclusion that he is their Lord. That's the third thing I want to look at, and some of you guys are familiar with this argument, but uh, it's the argument from mere Christianity of, of Lord, liar, and lunatic. Turn over to, with me to Matthew 16 real quick. And we will come back to Colossians, I promise. This is not just a long introduction for the end of our <laughs> study in Colossians or something. It's just, that was just a short part of it, but we'll come back to it. And I'll set the scene for you guys. They're in a place uh, called Caesarea Philippi. And it's a place that actually we, we've gone and visit. We go to visit when we go to Israel. And it's, this is the Bible study we do every time we go there. So I, I'm familiar with, the, in my mind, the geology of the place. But basically there's a huge cliffside that Jesus would have been on the, at the base of teaching this. And there's a point where Jesus calls Peter the rock. And he, and he uses a couple different terms. Rock in terms of Peter is his small rock, like a stone. And he says, on this rock, I will build my church. And he's probably referring to, the, you know, looking at this giant rock behind him, that is this mountain, and saying, that's the rock that we'll build the church on. It's Christ. It's the claims that he says here. But look at verse 13 with me. He says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Now a lot of people, and I, I have lots of grace with people. A lot of people think Christ is Jesus' last name, right? You guys know this. It's Jesus H. Christ. This H is his middle name. And I just came to the revelation this week when I was studying for this study that Jesus' full name actually would have been Jesus, son of J Joseph. And that's the, typically in the last name in that culture, it was son of, and actually would have been, you know, in Hebrew, Jesus bar Joseph. And... The name Christ is a title that was given to Jesus, and the meaning of that is anointed or chosen one. 
And when Jesus asks his disciples a question of who do men say that I am, they come up with some answers I think that actually people give similar to today. You know, at first they, they say, well, some say you're, you're John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, if you're not familiar with him, he was the forerunner of Christ. He was the one who prepared the way for Jesus to come into this world. And he had an awesome ministry, but John the Baptist was more of a, a, a morality teacher. He taught people to repent from the sins, to be walking. He actually baptized people for the remission of sins, which is not what we do. When we baptize people, it has nothing to do with washing away sins. It has to do with death, burial, and resurrection. And so John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ, preaching good things, teaching good things. People really liked John's message, or at least some people did. Others, not so much, and that's why he was put to death. But John the Baptist was a guy that, you know, again, had, had a, a gravitas, if you will. Some people respected him, and they're like, Jesus, you're like John the Baptist. You've done some great things. You're a great moral teacher. You're, you know, we can respect the things that you say. I want to receive from you because it's good stuff. And there are people, in, again, in our world who say the same exact things about Jesus. Jesus, he's a good moral teacher. We've learned so much from him about how to treat the world. They'll quote Bible passages and, you know, things that, partial things that Jesus said, but not complete things. And they'll have that mentality again that Jesus is, you know, we just love him. He's such a great guy. And he just left the world a better place than it was before. Some say that he was Elijah. Now, Elijah is a different story. He was a pretty rowdy guy, one of the most radical prophets in the Old Testament, did some pretty rowdy things, did some crazy miracles like Jesus. You know, his were more like bring fire down from heaven or stop the rain. Jesus' were a little bit more productive, I suppose, <laughs> like heal people from blindness and leprosy. But uh, he did some great things. And, you know, there are even people that, that claim Jesus is a prophet. You know, Muhammad believed that Jesus was a prophet. You know, the, the Quran states that Jesus is a prophet. He's a, he's a prophet that we should receive from. He has things to say again that are good. And almost no one has, says anything bad about Jesus. Now, the only thing that we might add to the list in our day and age is that Jesus is our homeboy as well, right? Jesus is our buddy. He's our pal. We're friends with him, and, you know, we, we can hang out. I, no one really ever says anything bad about Jesus. And the problem with all those answers is Jesus does not allow you to just say that about him. Yeah, he's a, he's a good moral teacher. He's the best moral teacher, but that is not what he is. He's, he is a prophet. He is the prophet, but that is not who he is. And he's your friend, but that is not the end of who he is. You guys, here's a man that claimed he could forgive your sin. Think about that claim. You, your sins are forgiven is what he says in Luke 5, uh, 20 to 21 and to the paralytic on the bed. Your sins are forgiven you. You know what the Pharisees wanted to do at that point? They wanted to stone Jesus because they thought within themselves, who alone can forgive sin? but God. Jesus claimed he could give everlasting life in John 6, 40 through 47. I'm the life. I'm the bread. You come to me and I will give you everlasting life. Those kind of statements. He, he claimed that he would judge the world of their sin in Matthew 24, 27 through 30. And if Jesus was a mere man and, he's, and he, you, know, you cannot say that he is a good teacher or a prophet, a good prophet. In fact, that again, this is an argument that C.S. Lewis didn't invent it, but I think he perfected it. And I'll read you guys a quote from Mere Christianity. And he says, I'm, not, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Christ. I'm ready to accept that Jesus as, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. And then he says this. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg. I love C.S. Lewis. Or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come away with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And if you follow that argument, which is again brilliantly conceived, if Jesus believed he was God and he wasn't God, he's on par with the man who believes he's a poached egg. <laughs> he's cuckoo. He's, he's nuts, you guys. That is absolute nonsense. It's craziness. 
And he believed his whole life, I'm God and I'm the Spirit of God. And I, he made the claims again that he would be the one that raised people from the dead. He would be the one to give everlasting life. He would be the one standing at the right hand of the Father. Those are, those are absolutely insane claims to make if it's not true. Now, if he didn't believe that he was really God, but he told his disciples that he was, Think about the deaths that his disciples suffered and then on top of it, the millions of Christians that have been put to death for their faith, that suffered for their faith, that this astounding number of people who have gone through their whole life believing that Jesus was the Son of God and he wasn't. And if Jesus knew he wasn't God and he convinced all of his disciples to lie about it or he convinced his disciples that he was and he knew he wasn't, he's on par with Satan himself. And that's exactly where we're left is Jesus is either crazy, he is a liar on par with Satan, or he is Lord. And then you go back to the question of what Jesus asked his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Because it doesn't matter what the world says about Jesus, it matters what we say about him. Who is he to us? And that's the, where we go with this, you know. And I'm obviously sharing these arguments for Christ not to convince all of you. You guys are here on a Sunday night. And you could be doing a lot of other things. I imagine most of you are, are believers or all of you are believers. But I'm giving you these arguments to equip you that when you share with non-believers and skeptics, you have a good defense. In fact, in 1 Peter 3.15, it says, if someone asks you your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. We should always have good answers for people. And you can know the world is going to know their stuff when it comes to arguing against Christianity. Now, there's, there are, their arguments may, ha, may not be very well put together, and they're not very logical, and they may lack substance, but they're going to fight with passion against Christ because that's what the world does, and that's what Satan does. He, again, it's not about reason and stuff. Actually, go with me back to Colossians, and, and we'll read a little bit of this passage again and kind of go back through it, and we'll close with that. In Colossians 2, 4, it says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Isn't that the world? The world is very persuasive in their arguments against Christianity and against Christ and against the things that the Bible has to say. They're very persuasive, you guys. It's how we get laws passed against, you know, uh, biblical principled things like foundational things like marriage. It's pretty simple marriage, you guys. It's not a hard thing to figure out. And the world is very persuasive in their arguments against it. They're very persuasive in their arguments against life. Abortion is a really simple issue to figure out once you know some simple details about what abortion is and what human life is. And yet the world is very persuasive in their arguments against those things. And they'll tell you, again, they'll, they'll spin a lie and make it sound like truth. And again, they'll tell you the truth's not a thing. And they'll try to convince you otherwise. It's just crazy. But they, Paul is here warning us, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And what Paul's speaking to is the fact that I'm not here. I'm not there with the Colossians, with this church, but I'm there with you in spirit. And these are the things I want to share with you. He says, verse 6, there, you, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And there's our theme, is we have received Christ as believers. That's who we're to walk in. That's how we're to walk. And, you know, for our college group, that's what the, the idea of the series is. How do we maintain this? tight walk with the Lord? How do we you know, stay rooted and grounded and have these roots that sink in deep in a world that's so shallow? And I'm not just talking about Christianity shallow, but the, the world is shallow in, in general, man. The world is so into appearances, so into frivolous things that make no difference of, of the reality of what life is about. And so how do we have depth in the, in the midst of this surfacey culture? And, you know, if you're still skeptical of Christianity, we, we can check chat personally about that afterwards, but, you know, the idea of being rooted in grounded love is for those who are, you know, purposeful and intentional, and, and the, you know, again, look at verse 7, it says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. I love that, you know, I love, especially the last part, to be abounding in it with thanksgiving, to, ha to be so thankful for the fact that we can have a faith that is deep. You guys, you're going to go, here's a, here's a universal truth. You are going to suffer at some point in your life. And I, I just remind people of this, like, you know, you get 
the choice of whether you want to go through life suffering in whatever circumstance or whatever trial it is. And we prayed for some of those things tonight. You get to decide whether you want to suffer on your own or you want to suffer with Christ. You want to do it on your own or you want to have the, the foundation of faith and the, the hope that we have as Christians of the afterlife and all these things. Or do you want to do it on your own? And here we have, a, again, Paul encouraging us to be thankful for the fact that we have a faith that's deep, for a faith that answers questions, that has good defense in that regard. And the idea of taking root obviously comes from plants and trees, digging the roots into the ground. And so much of the health of a tree depends upon its root system. Actually, I was just learning this, and I'm, this is from a future study that I'm going to do for our college group when we talk about fellowship, the, the need for church. But uh, you, know, you guys know California redwood trees are the tallest trees in the world. And they're absolutely, if you've gone to the Redwoods, I actually haven't done it since I was in fifth grade, I think. But man, it was, I just remember looking at these trees being in absolute awe of how huge they are. We even did the one where you drive through the tree back when it was free. And then, you know, it was a really, really cool thing to do. Uh, you drove through a tree. I could say I did that. I don't know why that's a, a boast of mine, but it is. And, you know, the, the whole picture of the Redwood tree is they're so tall, you would assume that their roots sink down like just super deep. And that's not necessarily the case. Actually, the strength of the redwoods is the fact that they're so clustered together and their roots go out not just deep but sideways and they intertwine with other trees. And I heard that and I was like, that's such a cool picture of fellowship because not only are our roots supposed to go deep, which they are, but you know, you want to get plugged in, you want to have a faith that's solid, you have to be intertwined with believers. You have to have your lives intermingled with them that when you try to escape them, there's this tanglement that you can't get away from. And that's a great picture of fellowship, and I'm stealing from a future study for you guys tonight. But that's a great picture, again, of roots here, that not only are we, you know, rooted for our own sake, but rooted for the sake of those around us. You know, there are things that are obviously important to trees. The root system is important, water, uh, sunlight. And there are mature things that we have to do in order to make sure our faith is mature. I Actually, the other word he uses here in verse 7 is established in the faith. And I like that word. You know, it's a word that, you know, when we see it, we see it on T-shirts that will say established since like 1990. And all my college kids are like, whoa, that's old, man. I'm like, I hate you. 1990, that's not old, Okay. And, you know, it's like when we, th- we see something that's established since, you know, ni- you know, 1970 or 1990 or, you know, 1910 or 1800, we're so impressed by it because we understand that it takes a lot, you know, for something to be around for that long is impressive. It stood the test of time. And that's the same mentality that I look at from those I want pointing to my life is how long has that person been established? You know, what kind of faith do they have? And the reason I say this is because there is a move and a shift in our culture again towards the, the surfacial, the superficial, where we look to people and we look to people who are almost like, you know, uh, famous in a regard. We, we're like celebrity Christians that we want to receive their information. We want to follow their Twitter feed or their, their Instagram and hear what they have to say. And a lot of these guys have been pastors for like two years, and it's just because they're wearing you know skinny jeans that we think they have something to say, and they shout real loud or something. And, you know, I just in my own life, and I think this is a biblical thing, you guys, is we surround ourselves with people whose faith are a lot deeper than our own. We want to find people who stood the test of time. And that goes for people you receive marriage advice from. You know, that goes for people that you want to, you know, receive counsel from, whatever it is. You find people who, whose faith has been around for a while, and they're old and rugged. And I like that. You know, I, my, some of my best friends I actually go golfing with uh, three other guys, and they're all over 50, and I won't name any here. Some, one of them's here tonight, but I won't name them. Uh, <coughs> Nelson. And... Uh, Oh, there's two. I heard another another one laugh out there. Where, <laughs> and uh, I love I love golfing with them. And you know, I'm the young guy in in that group. And it's I just you know, I reason I like having these guys around that are much older than me is because I want to see how they do things. I want to know how they live, and I want to see how their faith is established and what they've gone through. And you know, again, there's just a mentality in our world to seek people who are much younger than us or people who are our age to receive from and it's just foolishness there's a story in fact in uh, first kings where the 
first king after Solomon. So David, Saul was king. Uh, he, the kingdom was taken from him, given to David. David had a son named Solomon who was the wisest man, but really foolish, very contradictory. And uh, he was the wisest man. He had a son named Rehoboam. And there's a point in Rehoboam's kingdom where he is you know, basically given the, the, the problem of the people. And the, the problem was that the people had served Solomon so rigorously and they'd been so just beaten up by his administration because Solomon was into building grand things and building the temple and whatnot that uh, the people the elders of Solomon came to his son Rehoboam who had taken over the kingship at this point and said if you just lessen the burden on these people just re- just a little bit this back off ease off a little bit these people will serve you forever and then Rehoboam it says asked his friends his peers his his counselors who were his own age and they said Rehoboam you need to increase the burden on these people. They're, they're whining. They're, they're being punks. And you need to show them your authority. And if your father's, you know, if your father's pressure was the pressure, I think it was the width of a thumb, you're going to be the pressure of the width of a waist or something like that. I'm probably butchering that. But it was the idea that you're going to come down hard on these people and show them who's boss. Well, Rehoboam foolishly followed his friend's advice. And because of that, the, the nation of Israel had a civil war. And 10 tribes went and with the north, with Jeroboam, his adversary, and he was left with just two tribes. And that was the rest of the history of Israel. In the book of Kings and Chronicles, you read through and you'll see, you know, Judah and Israel. And they're two distinct nations, the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel, because of a, a, a stupid guy's mistake, because he, again, followed the dictates of his friends rather than those who had been, you know, around for a while and had roots that went deep. And I just encourage you, find people around you that can do that. And, you know, the, the guy that I was talking with, uh, you know, one of the college kids I was talking with about, you know, the uniqueness of what we do in our rooted group, um, he was like, I can't believe it's not so much bigger. I mean, he's been here for almost a year. He's like, I can't believe it's just like hundreds of kids coming through. And you know what? There's, and I could say the same for the church. I, I look at what we do here on a Sunday morning, and I'm like, why is not every person in Tri-Cities in this church? I, just, I, think, I think it's crazy that, you know, we come up with all the excuses why we don't have more people. Steve goes too long sometimes. I'm like, really? You can watch like 24 hours of 24, but you can't sit down and for an hour and 15 minutes for a Bible study. And I'm saying that to convict in my own self because I feel like that sometimes, especially when it's hot out and Billy goes 20 minutes long. But... We're like complaining or the music's too loud or whatever. The lighting's not good. We come up with all the reasons why not to, to make, you know, go to church or whatever. And I'm looking at what we do and going, how is this not more packed? And you know what? I, we wanted to. We could, we could pack this place out every week. We could have light shows and we can make it entertaining and less substance. You know, half hour Bible studies, maybe throw some secular songs in worship to really appeal to the non-believer and kind of do those kind of things. You know, the problem with that is, first, it's really hard to maintain because you have to be really entertaining, and frankly, I'm not, and Steve's not that funny either. And so, like, we're not going to get very many people to stick around very long. And then secondly, it's something that you have to you have to do a, pour a lot of time into, and it's really not worth taining, maintaining anyways because you end up with a group of people who are as deep as the, the church is, as deep as that message is. And the reality is the best way, the time-tested biblical method for growth is discipleship. It's pouring our lives into other people's lives. It's one-on-one relationships with people. You know, Chuck Smith, uh, the founder of Calvary Chapel, said that sheep beget sheep. And if that is our ministry as believers, is to, to make, you know, and that's, you know, from Steve's perspective too, that's something he quotes to us often. And we want to see the church grow. We have, to, we have to water the sheep. You feed the sheep. You love the sheep. And the sheep will grow themselves. You can't manufacture some great thing again because if you do that, then you have to continue to do that. And then you have people coming for that manufactured thing rather than for Jesus. And the problem with this process of growth is it does take time because it takes time to invest in people. It takes time to to learn people's names and to call them and text them and hang out with them and, and, you know, to love them in those regards. But the labor, the fruit of that labor is so much more plentiful. It's such a, a much better way of method of growth. And I've experienced this firsthand, you guys. I've seen so many people over my years of ministry follow the Lord and the relationships I've had with them. Again, from junior high ministry, I love it. I see so many kids in my college ministry now. And I'm looking around going, 
gosh, I w- these guys were punks in sixth grade, and they're still punks, but now they're older. And, like, I've got to do some other weddings, and I've got to be a part of life. And it's this established faith that we want, these firm, deep roots that, that will bring growth. And maybe not growth in numbers the way that we would expect, but growth in maturity and of believers. And that's what, you know, excites me about being a follower of Christ is we get to pour into people's lives. We get to see God do work. And, you know, just this warning in verse 8, which I'll close with this. He says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And just a warning there, the, the world has a lot of nonsense to offer, a lot of frivolousness, and there's not a lot of substance to it. It will leave you empty, it will leave you cheated, and it will leave you broken. And we have something as believers to be a part of this established faith is, again, to be rooted and grounded in the Lord, be producing fruit. By the way, fruit is produced for the sake of others. Trees don't eat their own fruit. That would be weird and cannibalistic, right? You, you produce feet fruit to bless others. Now, you might have noticed this whole time that the, the tree that we picked for our rooted group is actually a pine tree. I don't know if you guys have tried to eat a pine cone before, but actually I did look it up. There are animals that eat pine cones, so there, that is technically the fruit of a pine tree. And actually I was thinking about it, the, the squirrels and the birds that eat them actually treat them more like nuts. And I was like, that's probably a good illustration for what we really are. We're really more nutty than we'd like to think. We're a bunch of nuts spreading nutty pine cones and then watching God grow the tree and do this great thing, this work we call the church. So let's, let's pray on that note. Father, we thank you for uh, the work that you do in our body. And we're so blessed to have uh, the leadership in this church, biblical-based, and specifically Steve, God, who's faithful to go through the word every week, to go through and, and to share what it says, not what he thinks. And God, we're just in that regard, Lord, um, it is unique in a lot of ways. There's not a lot of churches that do what we do, and we're really thankful for that. And God, we're thank you. We're thankful for those in our lives who are deeper than us, that we can draw from, that we can look to, and we can be encouraged by. And Father, I just thank you for the, the people here tonight even wanting to strengthen their own faith and have a relationship with you. And Father, we just pray for that method of discipleship to take root, Lord, that we would be building relationships, we would be investing in one another's lives, and our root system would be dependent upon those around us. God, that, w- that would be the thing that establishes and, and confirms our faith and allows us to, again, stand the test of time and amidst the trials and the circumstances of this life, Lord, have a faith that doesn't wither and die. And so, Father, we commit the time to you tonight, the, the, the way home, the tribes home, Lord. We just give them up to you, pray you keep us safe this week, and uh, just help us to be people who desire to walk with you and, and are called so to do. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a good night.